So uh, before I start, uh, there is a paper on this topic, which you'll find on uh, Adrian Perig's website at DTH. I have not seen it myself, but it's probably easily accessible. This is work which uh, began actually in the fall at DTH while I was on sabbatical leave. And this, of course, was Adrian and David Bazin. So what I'm going to do is to tell you why uh, high assurance has been a bad word or a bad phrase for a long time. And people rejected it. And the question then next is why revisit it? Uh, what, what changed over time? So I'm going to try to do that um, and show you a sufficient argument for what's called select, what I call selective high assurance. And then I'm going to motivate the need for selective high assurance. In other words, it's not an option. And it will not be an option in, for the near future. Okay, and finally, a uh, small challenge. And if I have time, I'll talk about a system that illustrates how we apply what I'm going to describe here. And the last part is, hopefully, if I have time, I'll cover it, is a project which is ongoing between ETH, National University of Singapore, and, and myself at CMU. So, uh, <coughs> so what's high assurance? What do you mean by that? Uh, tip, well, what do you mean by commodity software? Commodity software is what we all know. It's general purpose software available for purchase by anyone, anywhere on an open market. High volume sales, low cost, Nothing to do with special purpose government software. Uh, what's high assurance? It's basically mathematical methods. Usually people call it formal assurance, formal uh, logic or formal proofs. And this encompasses formal logics, number theory, information theory, and the like. And these methods are used to prove security properties of a program or a set of programs. And these techniques go way beyond common criteria highest level of evaluation, seven, or the old uh, US uh, TCSEC A1 level. What's beyond, we go and apply formal methods to source code, not just to design specifications. All right, so an early example, the earlier that I can think of, um, is uh, the verification of penetration resistant prop resistance properties of a set of programs, which encompasses a secure Xenix kernel, that's a Unix kernel, um, where this, we specify these properties and we did their proofs in Prolog. This had nothing to do with the information flow that dominated the 80s, the 90s, and the 2000s. This was real life uh, penetration properties, penetration resistant properties. And they included uh, entry and return point protection in the kernel, parameter checking on the kernel entry, time of check, time of use, atomicity inside the kernel, inability to control execution of kernel functions, internal kernel functions, and independence of kernel programs on user actions. All these were quantified, they were expressed in um, basically uh, verifiable proofs in Prolog. All right, so uh, why not high assurance? Why is this that we haven't continued this and why is that the industry has not adopted high assurance at all and formal methods at all? So the first thing is the high assurance has a very high opportunity cost. Why? Well, there's going, always going to be rapid innovation in the commodity software and this will always lead to low assurance systems. Why is that? Why rapid innovation? Zero cost of entry, zero liability, zero regulation. Very high innovation. Now, if you innovate at a high rate, you cannot take the time to do mathematics on code. Uh, period. It's never going to happen. So if you have a system, you'll never have high assurance, a high assurance commodity system that has million lines of code. And when I mean never, I mean never. <laughs> okay. So, second reason will always have large commodity software systems, which I called, uh, I'm paraphrasing battle lamps, and I call giants. So there will always be giants, commodity system, whose security properties are either unknown or, hard to, or known and hard to prove, or both. Uh, so we'll never escape from this. Lamson has a motto which says, in software, only giants survive. Um, Third thing is an observation by Lamson again in the 2000s. 
Uh, and he says, look, defenders are rational. High assurance everywhere in a commodity system is impractical. So what do defenders do? They balance the expected cost of recovery, which is the recovery cost from a breach times the probability of the breach, versus the cost of prevention. What we mean by prevention is prevention using formal methods of proving security property. So they balance this. And it turns out that for the longest time, the balance tilted away from high assurance or from formal methods. So that's an observation that has been with us uh, since he made it more than 20 years. So now the question is, what has changed? Why are we revisiting high assurance? Two trends. First one, the recovery for, for cost from breaches has increased substantially. Uh, right now, the cost of recovery from cybercrime is about 1% of global GDP. That's real money. That's a lot. The cost is very high. The average cost of a breach has now been measured to be, be about $4.2 million. If you use a mature zero-trust architecture, it decreases to about $3.2 million. If you use AI and machine learning methods to detect early possibilities of penetration and penetrations themselves, you decrease the cost of recovery to 2.9 million. That's the smallest average cost. It's an average of minimum costs. We have a 10% year-over-year increase in the cost of recovery. So I think it was about 2021. Okay, second thing, second trend, which is very positive, is that the cost of formal methods has decreased dramatically. So I have a number of uh, figures here, which you can probably see. Uh, Security Enhanced L4, uh, formal verification at the source code level, uh, was about $332 per, per source line of code. This was reported in about 2013. Of course, the project started earlier. Uh, Microsoft's Ironclad applications, $128 per source line of code. Um, our project at Canaimel and IO Separation Kernel and its applications, $225 source line, uh, I mean, dollars for source lines of code. And the Evercrypt libraries uh, that Microsoft and Carnegie Mellon did, uh, $40 source line of code. That's one-ninth of what SEL cost in 10 years earlier. Now, we can quibble with these numbers that yeah, we have different skills, different problems, different complexity and so on. No question. But the trend is dramatically decrease cost of formal methods at the source code level, which is extremely positive. So essentially what I see happening is the balance is beginning to tilt ever so slowly towards formal methods, otherwise known as high assurance. Okay? So these are the reasons why we should revisit high assurance. Um, the, the, so I mentioned two reasons. What's the second reason? The second reason is that we are now able to isolate small security critical pieces of software in a giant. And I call those small pieces of software that we can isolate, I call them WIMPs. And we can prove formally the security properties of WIMPs. Not of giants, but of WIMPs inside giants. Uh, so essentially, let me give you a little bit of notation to see what more or less what's going on here. Let B be the number of selected attacks to be countered by formal verification in a giant source code. Okay. C sub B of verification is the one-time cost that it takes to verify those WIMPs, the, say, penetration-resistant properties of the WIMPs. C sub B of recovery, all red, is the minimum, which is an average, of course, here, minimum recurrent annual cost of recovery. This is a recurrent cost of recovery from B breaches of the giant. If the giant is left completely unverified, you'd have this recovery cost. And, of course, there is a market cost for recovery when you share the giant or between M defenders, M companies, M enterprises, each one of them using the giants for N years. That's a market. Okay, so with that in mind, the question is, how can a producer recoup the cost of this selective verification? So in other words, I'm a producer, I'm willing to 
verify, say, 10 WIMPs, each one of them being maybe 70,000 lines of code. We can actually do that now. Uh, how can I re recoup my cost? If I can't recoup my cost, I, I won't even be begin to uh, undertake this. So it turns out that the producer and defenders can evaluate a balance. Uh, the red side here, CB recovery times one, is the expected cost of recovery that Lamson is talking about. Cost of recovery times the probability of a breach. Uh, on the uh, left side, we have the cost of verification of those B breaches. If the cost of verification is less than or equal to the cost of expected cost of recovery, then it makes sense to think in terms of selective formal verification. And it turns out that both sides can estimate these costs. So, for example, the producer can see the average costs which are published every year for recovery from breaches. So, he knows how far he can go with the cost of recovery. On the other hand, the producer knows what it takes to do formal verification. Why? Because they can ask security laboratories, security companies, uh, universities, they can read technical reports, and they can actually estimate what the cost of verification for those breaches are. So both sides can actually tell uh, that this is a reasonable criterion. Uh, I can give you other criterion in a minute, but let's take this one. So essentially, if you have three breaches per year um, against the average US company, I'm sorry, uh, 42 attacks per year against the average US company, three of those attacks succeed, three breaches per year. So the cost of recovery, the minimum recurring cost, is three times 2.9 million, as we've seen in the uh, previous slide, 2.9 million was the lowest cost. That's 8.7 million per year for as long as we can tell. Um, now, what the producer does is, says, okay, let me pick three WIMPs and let me magically choose the 72.5K uh, source lines of code and multiply that by the lowest cost of formal verification, $40 per lines of code. What do I get? Magically, <laughs> $8.7 million, <laughs> right? Magically. So, uh, of course, the three WIMPs, are, their sides are up to 72, so my uh, balance is satisfied. Okay, now, the problem is, how can I tell that anybody pays? Well, imagine that this red giant is there, and the red giant has T un remediated vulnerabilities, T-holes. Of course, we don't know what T is, but they are there. And out of those T, the producer chooses B of them, the green parts. Isolates them and formally verifies their properties, say penetration-resistant properties. So essentially, if, if the attack uh, of the adversary goes towards those B whims, the attacker loses. Now, in this case, obviously, not only we have the cost balance in place, but it turns out that it makes sense for one of the defenders to play the, play, play, play the uh, producer uh, because he pays C, CB verification, which is less than what it will take him to recover, in year one, zero afterwards. Doesn't matter what the other defenders do. They can pay zero if they want. The producer recovers its cost. What's the alternative? One alternative to say, ah, the defenders are smart. They don't pay anything. Zero cost. Well, if they don't, they end up having to recover, and that's a recurrent cost. Bad idea. They, they are penny-wise, pound-foolish. Second one is, suppose that the producer can control how many defenders are using uh, this, this giant, this piece of commodity software code. And suppose that they con can control the number M, a very large number. So the producer could just simply increase a little bit the cost of verification, increase the price of the product, and everybody will be happy. No. Why not? What do you call such a producer? A monopoly. 
and that's illegal, right? So the, the producer could never really technically, legally uh, cover this case. End of the story. We know that there are a few man, uh, predatory monopolies in the past, and they all controlled their markets, and they all passed this incremental um, cost for the quality of their software. Okay, now, what's the other extreme to this attack? Well, the adversary attacks what's not covered by the producer. It attacks the other T minus B uh, holes. So in this case, of course, we still have the uh, balance inequality. But now what happens is the producer hasn't wasted his time by hardening, by formally verifying the BWIMs. Why? Because the attack surface decreased and the probability of success has decreased. By how much? Very small epsilon. Okay? So our task is here is to find the smallest epsilon such that the new probability, y minus epsilon, multiplied by the market cost plus the cost of verification is less than the market cost. Otherwise, it wouldn't make sense for the producer to do anything. Okay, so it turns out that the smallest epsilon is greater than 1 over mn. m copies n years. Okay, now, we have the luxury to setting up, setting up an epsilon, and we set up the epsilon to the bridge uh, fraction. Out of the blue, we do this, and we say that epsilon is b over t minus b. Well, we now find an expression which says that the unknown t has to be less than b, the known one, because we know exactly how much we covered, multiplies by mn plus 1. If this holds, the producer recovers his cost. Okay, so what will happen is that the producer says, ah, I don't know what the market is. I don't know what, how many defenders share my product right now. I don't know what's going to happen in the future. But if that number m is going to grow over some boundary m0, I'm done, I'm covered. So if that m0 is small, the producer is fine. So he can actually figure out what M0 is, but he cannot tell how much larger the market is. So essentially, you'll see on the next slide that that market, M0, is going to be very, very small, okay, which is very, very good news. Now, it turns out that all the other attacks for which the producer can recoup his cost of formal methods fall between these two extremes. So us all the other attacks, in all the other possible attacks, the, the verifier, the producer, recoups his cost. That's a sufficient condition, but that's great if we can do that. So here is an estimation of the market. How do I get this estimate? Well, industry surveys don't give you a bunch of useful numbers. They don't give you T, the maximum number of vulnerabilities which are left in the giant. Why not? That invites attacks. They don't give you S, the number of commodity software systems per defender, per company, per organization. They don't tell you what they are. They don't give you the number of responders of the surveys per organization. They give you an entire responder numbers. And of course, they don't tell you how many defenders, how many organizations are using this commodity software system, M. So what do you do? Well, it turns out that we are not stuck. What they report is V, which is the total number of vulnerabilities for the total number of unknown companies very often. And they tell you how many people responded to the survey. So what do you do? We say T, which is the number of vulnerabilities per uh, giant, per system, multiplied by the number of systems per organization, S, multiplied by the number of responders, total number over number of responders in the organization to give us number of organizations, uh, that's going to be V. And from there, we derive very simply that T is R over S unknown multiplied by V over R known. R over S is less than one. You have more systems per organization than responders. So consequently, you get this T, the unknown T from surveys, published surveys, which is exactly what I did, and found that the, for, 
for example, data like for two years of operation, you only need about 330 companies uh, for a particular system to handle the three breaches per year. That's less than 5.3% of all the US companies registered on the US stock exchange. That's a very small number. Remember, M is in the tens of thousands, right? Now, um, there is another figure that I found from the same uh, survey, uh, which actually shows uh, something even more interesting, that T is greater than 250 unfulfilled or unremediated uh, vulnerabilities. And in this case, for an average 200 uh, giants per large company, which is a very small number, by the way, uh, you have M's like the size of the market for which the producer recovers its cost, be something like 42 or 12. So all these small numbers tell you that the producer can always recover the cost of hardening the B wimps in their giant product. Okay, well, unfortunately, that doesn't say much. Why not? That's a sufficient condition. That doesn't mean that this is a necessary condition to happen. So essentially, uh, what, I'll, what I'd like to do now is to show you why it's necessary to do selective formal methods or selective high assurance. Again, this is heresy, but luckily we are not in the Middle Ages anymore and heresies are free speech. Um, so, so let's start with Lamson's uh, expected cost of a defender. And what do rational defenders do? Well, they try to minimize either the recovery cost or the probability of a breach, make that small, or both. That's how you minimize the expected recovery cost. And let's try to see what happens when we do selective high assurance. Let's try to minimize the probability first. Well, it turns out that we distinguish that probability of a breach in two components. Probability of a breach which is allowed by assurance, whatever weak assurance you have, maybe none, and the probability of deterrence. It turns out that these are non-independent. What that means is that you cannot take the two probabilities if you have them and multiply them. You have to take the minimum. And this is very unfortunate, but that's the way it is. Uh, I can show you why the two of them are not uh, independent. For example, it may very well be that high assurance formal methods in one area deters people from attacking because they know that there are no holes. So clearly there is a connection there. All right, so what happens? With formal methods, you have what? Security functions, verification, monitoring, recommendations, and so on. Operational assurances, least privileged principles, separation of duty, false safe, felt safe defaults, and so on. Correctness assurance, formal models, design specification, code, proofs, security testing, and so on. So the more you do, the more assurance you do, the lower the probability of a breach is. Deterrence, increasing attack costs, detection and response, audit and punishment, name and shame, and so on. The more of this you have, the lower the probability of a breach is. So it turns out that these probabilities uh, are monotonic in the kind of assurances and deterrence you have. All right, so what you'd like to do is to combine these methods and take the minimum of them and make that lower than some sort of an upper limit. And that limits the probability. And hopefully, that upper limit will drive you towards probability zero. All right, so now, remember defenders are rational. What Lamson kept telling us, and he was absolutely right, is that low assurance makes the probability of a breach tends to one. And we know that that's the case. I'll show you in a minute why. Secondly, he says, look, if you really want to decrease the probability, decrease the probability of the beach by deterrence. And then you'll be okay. Unfortunately, this doesn't work. In the last few years, both the NSA and the industry literature tells us that you must assume breach. 
you must assume that you've been hacked with very good reasons, right? Average US company, 42 attacks per year, three breaches. Probability one of a breach, clearly, right? So consequently, the probability of deterrence is not zero. It actually goes to one. Probability of a breach if you apply deterrence. So deterrence doesn't get you anywhere. And what that means is the only thing that's left at this point is to decrease the cost of recovery and assume the probability of a breach is one. Okay, let's look at recovery. So what does, uh, what does industry show us on this recovery axis? Well, they show us that the average cost without zero trust is about five, I mean, the cost without zero trust is about five million, average 4.2, mature zero trust, Recovery cost is 3.2. AI and ML is 2.9. Is that a minimum? No, of course not. So what do you do to minimize your cost? You buy insurance, right? That's what drives everything to a minimum. You can't get below the cost of insurance because that's a market clearing price, period. I have the minimum. Well, guess what? I looked at all the insurance statistics and I can give you horror stories. A lot of the companies on the US stock exchange internationally cannot be insured, not because they cannot afford it, it's because the insurance companies will not sell them insurance. Let me just give you three reasons. One, they have unpatched vulnerabilities. If you have that, you are out. Second, insider attacks. How can we tell? So apparently, the insurance companies can make a case. Insider attack? No. State-sponsored attack? No. Acts of war? Obviously not. A lot of these things occur in just about all uh, major companies. So maybe about half of them, more than half of them, cannot purchase insurance, cannot minimize the recovery cost. OK, so what do you do? That's the reality. Probability of a breach due to low assurance, one, towards one. Probability breach allowed by deterrence, by weak deterrence, goes towards one. Recovery cost, no insurance. This is all very bad news. This is the assumed breach mindset that NSA tells you about correctly and VentureBeat tells you about as well. Well, here is what's left. We take Assurance that we make it selective. Remember those B WIMPs? Apply formal methods to B WIMPs. And decrease the probability of a breach due to assurance to some upper limit. Up to some upper limit. So you decrease the probability. Consequently, the expected cost goes down, which is what we want. Okay, so what happens? What's the goal? How much do you bring the, that probability down of a breach? How much in the way of high assurance do you apply to those WIMPs? Well, it turns out that we can't tell how much. Assume that we could buy insurance. <laughs> Namely, we can minimize the expected cost. That's the probability of a breach times the recovery cost. So now we know what the probability should be, right? The probability can go all the way to this ratio, which we know because we know the insu uh, insurance cost and we know the recovery cost. We know the upper limit. If we apply formal methods to decrease the probability of a breach to come below that upper limit, we decrease the expected cost of recovery to the minimum. No other choice, period. So those of you who don't know anything about formal methods, it's time to learn because for the next 10 years, this is what you're going to see happening. Okay? All right. So, uh, let me... Uh, so, the question is, how far down do we go? And this depends on the defender. That's no good. So, what we have to do is to come up with a metric which is software-dependent only, but not independent. Last slide. Okay? After this last slide. So there is a hypothesis of formal methods, which say formal methods imply no vulnerabilities, which imply no security breach, which implies probability of a breach zero. Wonderful. How do you interpret this? You've already seen it. Do it selectively. And you don't go to zero, you go to some upper limit. 
and how to do it, and here is how you do it. <coughs> you select a piece of software that has formal properties. You take that formal property, or all formal properties, and negate them. Get some negative terms and search the CV databases. And then you see what the property counters. Construct all attacks with those CVs, and now you know the attacks that you counter. And look in the literature and find out the cost. Look at the industry. And now you know the value of your security properties. So essentially, the, uh, the story is the CV vulnerabilities over 200,000 entries. Uh, they are published. There are published costs. Find them. You know the cost of formal methods. The idea is that here is a structure of the project. You take a system like Scion, which was developed by Adrian Perig, secure networking, formal proofs of source code. Take a security property, negate it, search the database, the knowledge base of CV, CW, CVS, derive CV relationships. We know how to do that, not easy, but you know, dependencies, activation conditions, and strategies, attack strategies. Add the value constraints from the literature and find the economic value of that security properties. If you are unsatisfied, go to ChatGPT and have it search all the published papers in networking <laughs> relative to those CVs or those attacks. Look at the internet incidents. News, press report, chat CVs will tell you what they are. But chat CV will also tell you some hallucinating stories. They'll find CVs, describe what the CVs do, and the two of them make no sense. And I have examples of that too. But nevertheless, this is essentially the process of determining the value, the economic value, dollars and cents, for this selective high assurance story that I have. OK. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you. And, uh, so thank you so much for a very interesting analysis. Uh, I am Sam Relvin. I'm actually from Microsoft, one of the giants. <laughs> so just a couple of questions, because a couple of factors that I am missing in your analysis is, first of all, I mean, we do have high assurances already, right? And, and we've seen historically that that is not a guarantee uh, for not being breached. So we see that, I mean, assurance is based on knowledge that we have today, and we see zero days, et cetera, vulnerabilities that are not known today. So even high assured systems can still be breached. So that's one part that I'm kind of missing here, which means it's not zero, of course. The other thing is that uh, we do have cost, right? Even today, even if you don't have formal assurance programs, there's a lot of accreditation, there is bug bounty programs, there is penetration tests, et cetera, et cetera, to discover vulnerabilities. So the cost already today is not zero to, I mean, there's some kind of assurance, although it's not high assurance formally, right? So those are, uh, just wonder about your comments on, on those factors well, that I'm so, missing. So first of all, uh, Microsoft produces giants. And secondly, in, uh, Adrian Perry takes, tells a hypothetical story, which is supposed that about year 2000, Microsoft would have invested $400 million in showing the penetration resistance of 5 million lines of code, which was then the kernel. And he concludes, even at $80 per security line of code of proofs, he concludes the world would be a lot better today if Microsoft did that. Now, uh, so uh, I don't blame Microsoft for not doing it, but we would have been all better off if they did. Now, they were rational. Not doing it was rational. However, uh, Microsoft has a lot of very good research in formal methods, like uh, Rustan Leno's Daphne, Rustan is now at AWS. And I forgot to tell you, this is being applied not because I say so. The application happened before I, we wrote this paper. AWS, read Byron Cook's work at AWS with selective high assurance to isolated applications. They don't tell you how they isolate them, but it's basically cloud isolation. 
virtualization of separate virtual machines and containers, that's isolation. And in those virtual machines and containers, they actually do formal proofs. So when I say it's coming, well, it's already here in small measure. No, I agree with you, definitely. We do that in Microsoft as well. But my question is, I mean, if you look at the factors, looking at the costs, that's, I'm, I'm missing those factors because one, it's not zero cost of breach if you have high assurance, and the other one is, is there's already cost today, and that needs to be factored in as well. That, that was my point, is I'm missing yeah. that in so the calculus. High assurance here is selective, don't forget. It's not everywhere. So the probability of a breach cannot be zero. But that doesn't matter. That's exactly the point. Selective high assurance is not perfection. And it does not matter. All it matters is what your technical advisor, research, uh, technical scientist, but Lamson says, decrease the cost, expected cost of a breach. And that's how we do it. <laughs> that's what a rational defender does. Definitely. Thank you for that. But just want to kick in the, the fact that today most of what we see, if you look at it, it's not code or vulnerabilities, it's functionality, right? And business processes, how business implement, uh, access management, etc. So it's that functionality versus risk always. So we need to factor that in as well. Right. We have to... Uh, take this offline, I'm sorry, uh, we are running out of time. Uh, if there is one more quick question, uh, we can take that, otherwise... Who has a question? All right, <laughs> please. Um, so the value here was measured from, uh, from a very <coughs> company-specific angle, that there's insurance and uh, government or legal costs, but what if the entity is... Uh, a government or military agency that where you costs That's would fine. be measured along some other axes. Yes, De very definitely. This is all about industry yeah. reports. Uh, by the way, the, the point again is very simple. The first part of the talk shows this is sufficient for the producer to recover its cost. Not perfect for security, but it's sufficient for them to do it. Second part says you have no choice. Hmm. Right? So. Microsoft has no choice, unfortunately. To be continued, to be continued. <laughs> we are running out of time. Virtual, thank you very much. <laughs> All right. <laughs>